Stay hungry, stay foolish. Most of us do not see ourselves as biased towards people or different races or genders. And yet, in virtually every area of modern life, disparities remain. Even in organizations which have, for the most part, embraced the idea of diversity as a mainstream idea, but patterns of disparity remain rampant. Breakthroughs in the cognitive and neurosciences give some idea why our results seem inconsistent with our intentions. Bias is natural to the human mind, a survival mechanism that is fundamental to our identity, and overwhelmingly, it is unconscious. Our guest today helps us understand how unconscious bias impacts our day-to-day lives and particularly our daily work lives. And he answers the question, is there anything we can do about it? For those of us seeking to understand and confront our own bias to human resource professionals and business leaders determined to create more bias conscious organizations in the belief that productivity, personal happiness and social growth are possible if we first understand the widespread and powerful nature of the biases we don't realize we have. We welcome author of Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives, and friend of the Innovation Show, Howard Ross. Welcome back to the show. Aiden, it's great to be back with you. Fantastic to have you back. I was looking back, listening back to our last episode, which was our search for belonging. That was two years ago. Wow. And on that show, we promised we do this episode on Everyday Bias. So yeah. delighted to have you here. Before we launch into it, a reminder that this show is brought to you in partnership with Microsoft for Startups. And you open the book with a brilliant quote by Bookminster Fuller that goes, 99% of who you are is invisible and untouchable. And I thought to demonstrate how so many of our biases are hidden, let's share some studies. There's some great studies you share in the book. I loved the French versus German wine study, the bias of referees, and how scientists have been found to rate potential lab technicians lower and plan to pay them less if the potential technicians are women. I think that the point that you're making, that these biases show up in negative ways often is an important one to understand why we see bias the way we do. I mean, we're all very familiar with the very public incidents of bias that show up. Um, Here in the States, we've had this repeated example of African-American men either treated inequitably or killed by police officers. Recently, we had another case of an African-American man shot by two white people and see the different reactions. And because of that, we tend to think bias is bad. But actually, bias is simply a brain function that allows us to make decisions quickly for the purpose of keeping ourselves safe. Sometimes they can be really helpful. So, for example, if you see somebody coming to you from a distance who's angry and glowering at you with their fist clenched, your brain quickly says, put yourself in defensive mode. That could be really helpful and maybe even save your life. But they can also, the same function can also have you make quick decisions that can end up being disastrous. And the interesting thing about that last study you're talking about, which is a Yale University study, what they did was they gave scientists, uh, you know, professors in science, prospective lab assistants, and the resumes they got were identical with one exception, and that was somewhere named John and somewhere named Jennifer. And they not only were more likely to hire John, they were more likely to pay him significantly more as well and say that they were more likely to mentor and tutor them, even though word for word what they got was exactly the same. And the irony of that study was that the female professors responded almost identically to the male professors. And and this is important for us to understand is that we've incorporated into our psyche these biases even about people like ourselves. Um, We used to call this internalized oppression. Now it's often called stereotype or internalized bias. And so we could be a part of a group and still have biases against that same group that we're a part of. The basketball referee one was done by some researchers at Wharton and Cornell, and they tracked calls done by basketball referees over about a seven-year period, and they looked at the calls against the, the race of the referee and the race of the player and found that white referees were far more often to call fouls on black players than they were against white players. Now, the interesting thing about this was when it came out, the NBA very quickly came out in opposition to the study, said that they were going to do their own study, which they never revealed the results of. So, it's, <laughs> But this is not, again, this is not like people consciously did it. It's like, In fact, it's not at all inconsistent with lots of other things we see, particularly biases towards African-American men, where they're seen as more frightening, more violent, 
more impervious to pain, interestingly enough. Uh, some studies in healthcare show that, that uh, black patients are given less pain medication for the same presenting pain, that sort of thing. And so you could see how a referee would see this guy as the tough guy in that interaction based on all those preconceived notions. And I'm sorry, Ian, you have to remind me of the first one you've mentioned. The first one was the, the German and French wine study. Oh, that's right. And that, this one's really interesting because it really speaks to how we're subliminally influenced. So what they did is in a British supermarket, they went in and they stocked the wines only with German and French wines. And alternative days, they played German music or French music and had a flag up of the, of the respective country. And then they tracked people's buying patterns. And what they found was that more than 70% of the time, people bought consistent with whatever was on that day. So if it was German music playing, they bought the German wines. If it was French music playing, they bought the French wines. The interesting thing is when they asked people, only 14% of the people said that they even heard the music in the background, and only one person acknowledged that it had something to do with their choice. The rest, I guess, was just coincidence. So um, so we have you know, these this subliminal influence that's with us all the time, and that could be the news that you watch or the conversations that occur in a particular circle you're in or your personal exposure to people. But actually, we find that personal exposure is less impactful than stereotypical exposure. So, for example, in places where you have very little diversity, we tend to have the highest levels of racial bias because people are not dealing with real people. They're just dealing with the caricatures of those people, which tend to emphasize stereotypes. Yeah. And I wanted to come back to one you mentioned there about the negative impression of ourselves. And you've mentioned countless studies that this happens in. But one we mentioned on the last show that I think is really worth highlighting is the Clark doll experiments, because I have to say, I don't know if you saw this recently, there was a video sent around Twitter, I may have shared it with you, and it was to do with Little House on the Prairie, and there's an episode called The Wisdom of Solomon, and it's an African-American kid, and he actually is the kid who went on to be the star of Different Strokes, uh -huh. but the reason I, I share this is he had such a negative perception of himself that he did not want to be a black kid. And he said he'd rather live 10 years as a white kid than 50 as a black kid because he didn't want to share the same fate as, as his father. And there's a several reasons I mentioned that. I'd love if you share the, the Clark Doll experiments. But also, one of the reasons I share that is that was so valuable for me as a kid because I grew up in the 70s. I, I was born in the 70s. And they were the type of messages we were shown that were so valuable. But today in this environment of YouTube and short form content, where kids are playing computer games more and more, those lessons aren't there anymore. And they were so vital. It really dawned on me how vital those messages were growing up. Yeah, there's no question about it. I think that all that messaging is is very powerful. And there's, there's some great stuff being put out now. But the problem is, of course, there's also some horrific stuff being put out at the same time. And we're exposed to all of this. And, and there's so much information now that the um, ability to discern between what's real and what's not real is, is very difficult. But getting back to your question, the Clark Dahl study is one of the most famous studies of race relations in America. Back in the late 1940s, a psychologist named Kenneth Clark was, was um, asked to do a study of the impact on school segregation on children. And, uh, and, uh, the irony of the study was that he actually conducted the study with his wife, Mamie Phipps Clark, whose idea the study was, and who actually conducted most of the study. But historically it's known as the Kenneth Clark Dahl study. So I like to say it's ironic that here's this famous race relations study that's, that's, um, sexist in the way it's portrayed historically <laughs> just goes to show you that we've always got something going on. So what, but what the Clarks did was they, they showed children, um, little children, uh, dolls and the dolls were identical with the exception that one was white and one was black. Everything else about them was the same. And they asked the children to choose the doll that they would rather be like or play with. Um, and all of the children, including the black children, chose the white dolls. And um, some of the video clips, which I've seen over the years, are just heartrending because you see this child with this doll in their hand. Little one sticks in my mind is a little black boy and he's got this these two dolls in front of him and the interviewer says to him which is the good doll and he points to the white doll and he says which is the best doll and he points to the white doll which is the bad doll he points to the black doll and then he then he, they say which doll is like you and he starts and you can see his hesitancy as he wants to go towards the white doll but he he goes towards the left doll when he when he has to say this is like me and you see his face just sink 
And then which doll would you like? Of course, he chooses the white doll. So this study was was incredibly powerful. And in fact, uh, Earl Warren, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, who headed up the Brown versus Board of Education ruling that desegregated American schools, said that that study was what basically flipped the court. When they saw the results of that study, they realized that school segregation just couldn't continue. Yeah, which just shows why this work and your work is so powerful and so important in society, which is why I mentioned that little house in the prairie episode. Those episodes are so yes. important. And thankfully, thanks to the mere exposure effect and globalization, more races live together. So we're more used to other races. But certainly in Ireland in the 70s, there weren't very many African American people around. You had your own differences, of course, Aiden, around religion, which played out in, in the same kind of irrational decision making often in Northern Ireland. So I think this is human and we saw it in Rwanda with people of the same race or, you know, all throughout history, we've seen people divide between us and thems and go at it after each other. Absolutely. And we'll get into that because as you said at the top of the show, this is baked into our consciousness. This is baked into our physiology. We do this for positive reasons in a way, but they just manifest in negative ways. And for those of us who think we're, maybe we're immune to gender or race bias, there's a really interesting study you point out about weight bias. And in a world where obesity is rampant, I quote a study by David Miller that you mentioned, an associate professor of internal medicine at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And he said, anti-fat stigma is so prevalent. And by the way, Everyday Bias was written in 2014. Many of these studies are 10 year old or more. And this, I think, is so prevalent in our society. But Miller said, anti-fat stigma is so prevalent and sig a significant barrier to the treatment of obesity. Teaching medical students to recognize and mitigate this bias is crucial to improving the care for the two thirds of American adults at the time who are now overweight or obese. Yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing about that study, which, by the way, was replicated in at least four other universities that I know of, and they all show the same thing, which is that doctors discriminate against patients who are obese. They give them less time, take their concerns and complaints less seriously, follow up on protocols less often. It's almost like they say, ah, they're not going to care. Why bother with them? But the irony is that at the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University, a study showed that patients do the same thing with doctors, that patients also um, have a lower uh, opinion of doctors who are overweight and tend to listen to them less and give them less assessment scores for this very same kind of behavior. So we do this to each other. But, but the truth is, we do this in so many facets of human life. I mean, we've had over 1,500 studies in the last 10 years alone of this phenomenon of bias. And it shows that if you can name a physical characteristic of human beings, I'm pretty sure I can produce a study for you that shows how people discriminate around those differences. As we mentioned, those differences or those biases are so hidden. And at this stage, I'd love if you'd share the Sufi 13th century fable of Nasruddin Hoja, Turkey's renowned ancient trickster. Yes, oh sure, of course. Mullah Nasruddin was a character in uh, in Sufi tales. If people know Aesop's fables, very much like the Aesop's fables, and they all had purpose and meaning. And he was often kind of a trickster. And so the 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 story goes that Nasruddin comes up to a border guard with a donkey uh, filled with hay, and uh, and the border guard looks at him and he's suspicious. He says, "I know this guy's stealing something." So he makes him take down the hay. He goes through all the hay, can't find anything. He says, "All right, go ahead and pass." And he keeps doing this, you know, with regularity every few days for, for a couple of years. And finally, he comes to the border one day and, and the border guard says to him, listen, I know you've been stealing something. He says, today is my last day on the job. I give you my word. I won't rat you out. I won't, I won't tell people what you know. But just for my peace of mind in my retirement, can you please tell me what you're doing? You know, and Nazardine looks at him, he says, or he says, what you're stealing? Nazardine looks at him. Sure. He says, I'm stealing donkeys. <laughs> you know, um, you know, he had unpacked all the straw, looked through all the straw, but he did never occur to him that the donkey, which was the most visible thing, is what he was stealing. And and I think that this is a good insight into into the nature of mind. I mean, we tend to look at the places we're used to looking, we think we're supposed to look, but often we miss things that are right in front of us. And and this is true even um in the most um dramatic kinds of circumstances. For example, Trefton Drew is a is a researcher at Harvard University. He's he's a um uh, studies uh, in the medical school. And he did this study with radiologists. He gave them a lung scan to look at um, that he had done. And in the middle of the lung scan, which these CT scans are done in slides, basically image after image after image, he stuck in five images in which 
And they were asked to look for, by the way, cancer nodes, which are very tiny. He stuck in five images in which an image of a gorilla, which was 50 times the size of the cancer node, but was dark and black as opposed to being white like the cancer nodes, but stuck it right in the lung. And you can see these pictures and you can't believe that anybody missed it, but 83% of the radiologists missed the gorilla because they were so carefully looking for something small that they missed something large that was right in front of them. So, And these are Harvard radiologists, Harvard Medical School radiologists. You don't get much smarter than that. So, so it just it's, it's important for people to understand this is not about how smart you are. It's about how aware you are. This is the idea of inattentional blindness and that famous study of the invisible gorilla. And one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this one was it's so prevalent and relevant for innovation because oftentimes when we're experts in our fields like these radiologists, we can miss what's happening on the outside world. And I think this is so relevant and why your work is more relevant today than it ever has been before, because in a world that's changing at such a rapid pace, we need to constantly challenge our biases, constantly challenge our sources of information and educate ourselves in permanence because of that exact thing. And I tell you, Aiden, there's no more place to see it than right now what's going on as people deal with the coronavirus. Um, you know, you've got two very different political points of view, different economic points of view. Um, you've got anti-vaxxers, you know, all these different people who have a position already about this virus. We should stay in lockdown. We should open up. And so what do they do? They go onto the internet and they, they get all the information that, that, you know, they see all the stories that align with their point of view and say, yeah, 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 yeah. And just don't even notice information or data that points to the other side. Um, and it's very difficult to have a conversation with anybody who's really weighed the information carefully on both sides because most people are pulled towards their oppositional points in gathering that data and in perceiving what they perceive. You go deeply into politics as well, but also those of us who consume politics, and you say in the battle between emotion and rationality, emotion always wins. And this is something we all experience with friends, loved ones, and family. Here you tell us, even when people are shown facts that disprove their point of view, they can double down on their original point of view. Yeah. In fact, there's this phenomenon that some psychologists have called the backfire effect that when you, and this is something we see happening in politics all the time, certainly that when you've got a point of view and that you're being attacked for the more information that's thrown at you, the more you're going to dig in because it's no longer about information or rationality. It's now about survival. It's about surviving the attack. And so what ends up happening in the brain is the amygdala, the fear center of the brain, takes over. It's It's been called by some people, I think Daniel Goleman, the, the father of emotional intelligence, named this the amygdala hijack. The amygdala sort of hijacks the whole system. The prefrontal cortex, which is the more aware part of our brain, the, the part of our brain that gives us more consciousness as we know it as human beings, sort of disappears, almost like the roof of a convertible flies open. And we're left with our fear response. And those fear responses are much more reactive and not often very thoughtful. And you nailed it here. One of the reasons I reached out to you at this time is you originally wrote this book after the dramatic recession of 2008. And this recession has not only devastated the world economy, but it contributed to a regression in the behaviors of bias we have been discussing. And history shows us time and time again that economic stress creates a greater sense of threat and fear of the other. And I fear we're seeing that today again. That's true. I mean, if you look at throughout history, the times when the most regressive regimes in history, Hitler, Mussolini, the Taliban, all of these kinds of things almost always emerge out of chaos in society and, and often economic chaos, more times than not economic chaos. And we're also seeing here in the United States, and I, I don't know in the UK with the, you know, how this shows up, but, but in the United States, um, you know, for example, that twi twice as many African Americans per population base per, per capita are dying from this disease as as white folks are, and 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 you know, I posted something about that on social media recently, and I said, let's please stop calling this an equal opportunity disease because poor people, people of color, those in in marginalized groups are suffering greater, and and somebody responded and said. Um, said, well, that's just stupid. You know, viruses aren't racist. And, and my response to him was, I'm not saying viruses are racist, but the way I think we need to think about it, because this points to the systemic bias in the system, is if you think of the virus as a seed, 
And the seed can go in one of two gardens. It can go into a garden that's fertilized with uh, plenty of water and plenty of sun and taken care of, no weeds. Or it can go into a, a garden that's mostly clay and baked and has very little of those other positive things. The seed will grow differently in those two environments. And I think what we're seeing is there are lots of different aspects of bias and discriminatory behavior that show up in the system that makes it fertile ground for this virus to take hold in a stronger way in the African-American community here in the United States. So as an example, a higher percentage of African-Americans are of low income. We know that. That's one of the impacts of systemic racism is that blacks have less earned wealth. They have less, um, they have less, they not only earn less, but they have less wealth. They tend to live in poor communities, tend to live in more urban communities, a higher percentage live in urban communities. The poor urban communities they live in have older cars, which produce more pollution. Therefore, lungs are more susceptible to lung illnesses. That's just one example. Another might be that the bias we see in the league, in the, among police officers towards black men leads higher numbers of black men being incarcerated. And prisons right now are one of the worst places for COVID because, of course, the prisoners are very close and have very little access to what they need to keep themselves safe. And so those are just two of a could be 50 different examples of how something that's not designed to make people sick with COVID nonetheless ends up that way. The other thing you mentioned there is we have more runway. So those people who are, have been blessed with wealth or have maybe jobs that were higher paying may have more runway to get them through this so they can emerge the other side because there is no doubt this lockdown when we're released back into the wild again we'll have to be locked down again it's not going to just magically go away yeah i mean look I mean, getting to, to what you were just talking about you know average white family in the united states has seven times the accumulated wealth as the average black family that means that if you're out of work for three months or two months you know you're laid off for a few months then let's assume it's only that on you might be able to carry that a lot easier if you've got a lot more accumulated wealth. That doesn't even count the fact that your parents might be able to help you more because your parents might have had more wealth as well. And so all of those things really support this notion that the same challenge hits in a much more difficult way for some people than for others. At this stage, I'd love to discuss, you mentioned this before, it's baked into us. So this is baked into our physiology about recognizing the us and them right back to the days on the great savannah where we came from the caves because we needed to recognize us of them for survival reasons yes that's exactly right you know we'd see a group of people around the water hole and we've had to make an instant determination whether it was us or them and if we made the wrong determination we might die so this has a tendency to focus us and so one of the things that we know is that the nat the tendency to separate people between us and them is a natural tendency and it depends of course the groups we're in we see it sometimes when we're um you know, let's say within our family, we argue with each other. But if somebody is oppositional to our family, if they attack our family in some way, we all band together very quickly to attack the other. There's a wonderful uh, joke that was, it's been called the funniest religious joke of all time is from a, a comic named Emo Phillips. And the joke goes like this. A guy comes up to a bridge and he sees somebody climbing over the rail and about to jump. So he runs up and he says, don't jump, don't jump. Why are you going to jump? And the jumper says, Nobody loves me. And the rescuer says, well, God loves you to believe in God. And the jumper says, yes, I do. And the rescuer says, good, so do I. What religion are you? And the jumper says, Christian. And the rescuer says, good, me too. What subdenomination are you? And the jumper says, Baptist. And the, the rescuer says, me too, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist. The jumper says, Northern Baptist. He says, me too. He says, Northern Baptist Eastern region or Northern Baptist Western region? And the jumper says, Northern Baptist Eastern region. And the rescuer says, me too. And then the the, the rescuer says, Northern Baptist Eastern Region Charter of 1783 or Charter of 1841? And the jumper says, Charter of 1841. And the rescuer says, die, heretic, and pushes him off the bridge. You know? <laughs> and that's sort of a window into the human mind. You know, we do that. We're constantly dividing, coming together, dividing, coming together, as it suits us for our self, sense of self and self and sense of self-protection. And um, we do this in society, of course. And People go through various times of being otherized. We've seen, for example, over the last 20 years since 9-11, the otherization of Muslims, you know, ramping up dramatically. And it just happens often conditionally based on what's going on in society around us. We're seeing this now, even with this COVID crisis, like there was a, in, in Ireland here, there was an attack on a, some Chinese people 
uh, in the city center because of COVID or originating in China. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. We're having the same problem here in, in the States. In fact, hate crimes against Asian people in general, not just Chinese people, but Asian people in general, because stupid and bias go together often, <laughs> um, uh, is, uh, has, have ramped up dramatically to the point where one week we had more than we had had the previous year. So again, when under threat, people especially fall to these patterns of behavior. Yeah, and mentioning they're stupid as well. This is because the irrational brain takes over. And there's a great story you share about Plato's Phaedrus dialogues. Yeah, well, Plato was really probably the first person who we know of. Now, that just means that he's the one who was recorded, but nonetheless, first person we know of who really talked about the mind in a complex way. And in Plato's model, the, the uh, rational mind was like the charioteer holding the raging emotions represented by the horses in place. And that became a model for Western civilization for 2,500 years. You know, we worshiped at the heart of the rational. You hear it in our conversations. Are you sure you're being rational about that? Are you sure you're not being emotional? But in fact, what we know is that emotions generally are the drivers of almost everything we see and do and trigger almost all of our behavioral reactions. We think, for example, if we see somebody, that we evaluate them, we come up with a particular point of view for them, excuse me, about them. But in reality, we know that what happens is, because we can now see the brain, is that we have the emotional reaction. And then in essence, what we do is we gather the data that supports that emotional reaction we have. I mean, a Albert Einstein said it well. He said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And so because of that, because we don't value the, our emotional reactions, we also don't pay enough attention to them. And so the, the rationalization that we've done is what seems like makes sense to us, even though it's all driven by our emotional tendencies. And once again, the political system is the greatest window into that because we can see it happening every day. You see two different people watch the same politician speak and they'll look at the exact same statement. You say, you see what I mean? Even though they're using it to prove two different points. So it's just, um, you know, it's our tendency to want to be affirmed, to want to get the information that affirms what we already believe. I'm going to come to how this manifests in the workplace now, because I find this work so relevant for innovation and change work and transformation within organizations, because these in-group, out-group phenomena happen in the workplace all the time. And it's one of the phenomena our listeners will surely have experienced, if, particularly if they're change makers in any way. And you tell us it goes back to as far as 1906, when it was recorded by William Graham Summer, who wrote, each group nourishes its own pride and vanity, boasts itself superior, exists in its own divinities, and looks with contempt on outsiders. And I think this is so useful for us to understand, because we can sometimes feel it's us, and we can sometimes feel we're the ones ostracized, or we're, we're doing things wrong, and it can affect mental health. But if you understand that this is baked into basic human psyche, you can understand it more and you can be more liberated. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think that there, you know, look, I mean, one of the things a lot of times people say to me, well, if you talk about unconscious bias, doesn't that let people off the hook? I don't think it lets people off the hook at all. I think it just points to the fact that we have to understand this about ourselves in order to work with it. You know, for example, you were talking earlier about your children and, and, um, I think every parent, I know certainly it's been true for me, I've got four sons and six grandchildren, and any parent I've ever talked to will admit in private that there's been a moment where you felt like, I didn't say act on, but felt like smacking your kid upside the head, you know, but because we all have that in us, that frustration, that anger that comes at, you know, being parents and, and you know, or there's sometimes we just feel like, you know, physically letting it out. But most of us, thank God, are, are um, thoughtful enough to say that's not a smart way to raise your child. Beating your child is not the appropriate response. And so we put the child into a timeout for five minutes and we cool off and they cool off. And then we come back and we think more rationally and more in a more di uh, appropriate way, what's the appropriate discipline for whatever the action was. I think similarly, uh, if we're aware of our biases, if we're aware that we have trigger points that can, that can cause us to react in ways that are not healthy, by being aware of them, we can mitigate the impact of those. It doesn't mean that the bias itself stops. The metaphor I like to use, it's a bit like standing on a clutch in a standard transmission automobile. When you step on the clutch, the motor doesn't stop, but it disengages from moving the car forward. And, and this is very similar. When we're aware of our biases, when we take responsibility for our biases, it actually makes it easier for us to prevent them from guiding our behavior. Yeah, I love that 
metaphor. You told me that one before, and it really stuck with me also because I found it's the same with fear because you explain this really well in the book where you talk about fear and people as amygdala hijack response. It's almost like it, mm-hmm. it's brake pads or clutch pads, if you will, that it can wear down if it's overly exposed. Yes. And one of the ways I found it fantastic to build it back up, to build up those pads was true meditation and actually the awareness because you catch yourself just before you're going to react and you respond instead. So this putting it into clutch, taking a moment and it's a split second and you go, no, there you go, chief, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways, you know, I mentioned about, about kids, it's so important, I think, to realize this. I've caught myself doing this before. That in-group, out-group bias. We parents are often the ones who start the ball rolling with children. We can say stuff, a throwaway comment about the neighbor or about some kid in the school or about somebody we're talking about where the kid over here is because all those little bits of information are thrown into the mixing bowl of the kid's mind and marinate over time to become their reality. That's exactly right. I mean, that's exactly how it happens. You know, we, uh, we basically um, get exposed to different things. We learn to process those things. Over time, um, those things become the beliefs that guide our way of looking at the world. But it's important for us to realize that this becomes a very unconscious process. Oh, you know, it's, it's under the surface. It's not like we look at things and evaluate everything. At some point, we make leaps of faith. And in fact, this is one of the functions, the most important and valuable functions that bias serves in our, for us in a positive sense. Let's say, for example, all of us walk across floors all the time, whether it's in our house, our workplace, our businesses, out on the street. We just walk. We don't think anything about the floor supporting us because our history and our body is that the floor is always there to support us. But what if we were walking across our house one day and we stepped someplace and there was a trap door and we fell right through to the second level, right? Now, what do you think it would be like the next time you walked across that floor? You'd be you know, reaching out with your toe to tap the floor each time. It's a little bit like anybody who's been burned on a stove knows this. The next you know, week or two, or sometimes even longer when you go to a stove, you're very hesitant about touching the stove because you had that experience of being burned in your background, in your back of your mind. And so what bias does is it stops us from having to live our life constantly being cautious, because we begin to realize that the odds of certain things are very slim, so it's okay. It's, floors are safe. And embedded in our mind is this notion floors are safe, but we're no longer thinking about it. It's sort of concealed by its obviousness. Well, the same thing could be true about white people being safe, but black people not being safe, about men being smart, women not being smart, about Muslims being strange and dangerous versus just another religion. You know, I mean, we could go through all of them, but it's all about, at a fundamental level, it's about safety and it's about how I feel secure in the world and what assumptions can I make that are fair enough to keep me safe. That's exactly what happens in organizations. That's psychological safety. Like you mentioned, for example, certain people in the office, in a brainstorming meeting, for example, may come up with ideas. Everybody will listen to their ideas, but then somebody over in the corner who doesn't speak so much, and gender definitely plays a role here, can say something and nobody listens to it or they they downplay those suggestions just because of the source. That's exactly right. And it can happen because of, uh, we know it happens because of gender and, you know, and there are, there are lots of studies that show this happening relative to gender, but it can also happen because of age. It could be generational bias. The young person at the table says something, you know, I had a friend years ago who was a Delta airline pilot. Sadly, he passed away uh, relatively young to cancer, but he used to tell me that he said to for years, the guys who were on the tarmac were saying, you know, we don't need to fire up all the engines to get it out to the top of the runway. And everyone would say, just shut up and do your job. You know, you're, you're just, that's not your job to worry about that. Well, sure enough, finally, somebody listened to them and they realized that they could save millions of dollars of flight fuel because they only needed to have one of the engines or two of the engines get on to have the plane have enough power to get to the top of the runway. Then they would kick the other engines on and, and go ahead and take off. And in the process, you know, jet fuel being as expensive as it is, they'd save millions of dollars in jet fuel every year. But the person who suggested it wasn't somebody who had value. And so, you know, it wasn't until later that that suggestion came by. And and I've seen, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in business where people have said to me coming in as a consultant, you know, we've been saying the same thing to them, but they wouldn't listen. But you come in, they fly you in from thousands of miles away and pay you a lot of money. And so you saying the same thing as us has more impact. 
And so, you know, we, we evaluate the person who's saying it, we evaluate the message, and all of that gets filtered through, through these various biases that we have. And you've just reminded me of the brilliant study or the brilliant uh, exercise with Joshua Bell with the classical music in Washington. Yes, yes, yeah. Joshua Bell, who of course is one of the finest uh, violinists in the world, uh, was doing a I was doing a concert at the Kennedy Center, which, for those of you who don't know, is the, the the big concert hall here in Washington D.C. Um, and so they did an experiment with him. Um, they had him go into one of the local subway stops and um, and set up with his violin case open, wearing t-shirt, jeans, and a baseball cap, and um, and played the exact same music that he that people had paid hundreds of dollars to hear him play at the Kennedy Center, you know, the day before or something like that, and. Um, and the people just walked by, you know, no more than 10 or 11 people even stopped. But it wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, just that, you know, where he was playing because then they then put up as part of the experiment assigned and said, this is Joshua Bell who played at the Kennedy Center last night and hundreds of people stopped to listen. So it wasn't just that it was in the subway and people didn't want to stop. It was some guy in a subway just didn't have the same kind of expectation of quality as the guy who was playing in the Kennedy Center. And, you know, we, we, look, there's so many stories about this, so many stories about that, you know, good, I just recently rewatched the film Goodwill Hunting. I don't know if you've seen that film. Oh, but fantastic. The guy who was the janitor who was this brilliant math guy and nobody believed at first that it could be him. He must be cheating or something until they realized that he was a savant, that he actually, you know, was brilliant in these, in these domains. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's, all of this has to do with expectations. And when you put this in a business environment, you know, think about the number of brilliant ideas that might have been lost. Um, you know, the, the number of people who could have been great leaders, um, that were lost because they didn't fit the picture of what people thought somebody who had a good idea or somebody who was a great leader looked like. And, and this happens every single day in businesses. It's, it's really, I, I hate hearing that, man. It's so frustrating for those people. I'm sure some of them listen to the show. They're the ones who bring an idea and it's not listened to, or they leave the organization and years later it's it's rolled out, but it's too late and the organization has missed the boat, etc. But it relates very strongly to the idea of attribution bias, but also to the halo and horns effect. So the source of the information, I'm thinking here particularly about silos within organizations or departments within organizations, and one department may suggest an idea to another, but because of the source of the information, they don't act on it. And I want to say, by the way, also, it's not just... It's, it shouldn't just be the people who are affected by this who are frustrated. It should be the organizations who are frustrated because they're the ones who are losing the capability of turning this talent um, on as much as they can and getting all the value of having this talent. So the irony is that while the people who are in the underserved groups tend to be the ones who feel the pain of it, um, the organization really suffers for it as well. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's in fact the sad thing that so many organizations don't meet their potential because their people in the organizations are not allowed to meet their potential. This goes right back to the hiring of, of the organization. So I mentioned uh, at the start of the show about how this is relevant for HR professionals. And this snack subject spoke to me as a former pro sports player, because coming into the working world as a early 30 something, having retired from sports. Yes, I was like Joshua Bell in a way. So there was this attribution bias or a diagnosis bias that what can he bring to the organization? And, and this happens in so many factors of life. But we develop these blind spots that stop us seeing people or circumstances that are exceptions to the rule. And this not only counts for job interviews, but also for in innovation opportunities. I'd love if you shared a little bit about this. Yeah, I mean, look, you look at yourself as an athlete, you know that people have this thing about dumb jocks. Some people have this thing about dumb jocks, and they they classify you into the category of that, and being an athlete for somebody like that is a detriment. Then you have somebody else who was an athlete who loves the spirit of athleticism and says, well, this is great. Athletes have learned to be team players, so that's a plus. And, and the same person, in this case, you, could be evaluated 180 degrees differently depending upon those two mindsets. You know, I know one company here in the States that was built because the guy was an athlete and he started his company in his garage with four or five of his friends we played sports with. And the whole company got built up around the sports culture. It was great. It was thriving, except if you were a woman, if you were a person of color or, some, or you weren't an athlete, um, the presumption was that was, you know, that you weren't going to fit in. And, and so we, so the same thing that helps us can be narrowing to us at, at some point. The important thing is we realize that once the mind decides that something like this is is important, 
um, we have a tendency to discard anything that counters that. There's a wonderful quote from John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a great economist back in the 60s and 70s, or the 50s and 60s, I guess, who said that most human beings, given a strongly held point of view and evidence to the contrary, will quickly go about refuting the evidence. Um, and, and so once we have it in our mind that this is the right kind of person for us, then we may miss the brilliant person who's the iconoclast. So let's say we, we set you know, qualifications for work, right? So let's say we say, okay, we want somebody with a college degree. Now that would make sense. You get a couple of hundred different resumes and you have to have some way to filter them down. So you say, okay, college degree. So you toss them out. But in the meantime, maybe you toss out Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, you know, all of these incredibly brilliant business people who didn't finish college. You know, actually, I'm not sure Musk may have finished college, but the other three didn't. You know, they were dropouts. And so we say, well, college dropouts, we're not going to hire any college dropouts. Well, you've just eliminated three of the most successful business, you know, icons of the 20, 20 and 21st century. Um, and, and this is the challenge with this kind of thinking. So there's nothing wrong with having qualifications. We just want to be really careful to understand that what qualifications are are simply biases that have been codified. And that means that they apparently do have these blind spots in them that we have to be careful about. Those ones are pretty, pretty uh, actionable. So we can cons reconsider those kind of things within organizations. But I found really fascinating when you talk about organizations and hiring people the unconscious bias patterns that exist in all areas of life, influenced by factors that surprise us, such as hand dominance. Yes, yes. This is one of my favorite studies because it's so crazy. You know, it's so out there. This is from the Max Planck Institute for Neurolinguistics in, in, um, in the Netherlands. And um, uh, what they did was they tracked people who were right-handed and left-handed, and they found this whole pattern of behavior that one, one aspect, for example, is if you're right-handed, and you're interviewing two people, and one of them sits on the on your right side, and the other one sits on your left side, the person on your right side has about a 3% greater chance of being hired. Now, that doesn't seem significant, but most of these biases don't play out in dramatic ways. Mostly they're subtle, and that might be the slight difference that gets that person over the hook. We all, they also found out that if you're right-handed and a politician is speaking and gesturing with their right hand, that you're likely to believe them more than if they're gesturing with their left hand. Now, Almost nobody, my father was left-handed and he used to talk about discrimination against left-handed people, you know, in a comical way. He used to joke about it. You know, you people, you know, all the scissors are made your way and none are made my way, you know, this yeah. sort of a thing. But we're talking about making hiring decisions based on stuff like this. And, and at a certain level, we would say that's crazy. And nonetheless, it is standard, normal human behavior. Yeah. And more of this that were just fascinating studies were these reactions that happen deep within our psyche. And one I found from the University of Toronto that you mentioned in Everyday Bias is the rainy day study of interviews. This yes. is unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, and and yet, and once you once you break it down, it makes perfect sense. So Don Rettelmeyer, who's who's a, actually a pretty advanced thinker in this field, he was a student of Daniel Kahneman's, the great Nobel Prize winner. Rettelmeyer is at the University of Toronto Medical School, or at least he was when he did the study, and he tracked medical um, school interviews uh, of students who were applying. Um, over, I think it was a seven year period. And, um, and you know, anybody probably knows that people who apply for medical school are generally all pretty smart. You know, by the time you filtered out to, to being applying medical school, almost everybody who's applying to medical school has great resume, great, you know, um, all the stuff that you need, the grades are good and all that stuff. And so, so the interview is, is very heavily weighted towards whether or not people get in. And what they found was that when people were interviewed on rainy days, um, it basically knocked their score down as th roughly the same amount as if they'd gotten 10% less on their MedCats, on their medical board examinations, you know, which means if you happen to come in on a rainy day, you're that much less likely to be brought in. Now, now, if you think about that, at first it seems crazy, but if you think about it, most of us have had experience. You're driving to work in the morning. It's a miserable rainy day. It's cold and wet. Your shoes are wet. Your ankles get wet. Your your you know your pants, legs, or whatever else gets wet. You come in, um, you know, at work. You you get yourself off, and somebody says good morning, and you say, "Oh man, what a mess out there!" Right? And you're in a mood from it. You come in on a beautiful sunny day, and the exact opposite happens. And um, you come in, and um, you're like top of the morning to you, and you know, great to see you, and uh, you know, great. Let's sit down and have this conversation, and and all of that shows up in the scores of the interview because it's the mood of the interview that affects it as much or more than the quality of the interviewer. 
keeping on the idea of hiring into the organization, I found it useful that you had highlighted two different ways of considering bias when it comes to me meeting other people. This would be interesting to score interviews objectively as possible <laughs> as possible. One is warmth and the other is competence. Yeah, so these were studies that were done originally by um, a research team led by Amy Cuddy, who was at Harvard Business School at the time. And what they found was that that we don't have the same kind of biases to all people. Um, for some people, we have biases based on warmth. In other words, do we like the person? Do we feel comfortable with them? Do they make us feel good being with them? And the other are competency studies. That is, you know, how qualified are they? That sort of a thing. We believe that competency is what we make choices based on. But virtually all of the studies that have been done around this show that warmth is by far a much stronger draw to us. We're drawn towards people we like. We're drawn towards people who make us feel comfortable, who are similar towards us. And we will be flexible about their competency as long as we like them. But if we don't like them, all the competency in the world sometimes can't break through. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this, you know, and, and based on certain people. But for the most part, that is what we're oriented towards is how the person makes us feel. And if you put that in the context of what we talked earlier about feeling side of our brain being the most impactful one, it makes perfect sense. It just is not the way we usually acknowledge how we're making decisions. And that's the problem is that we're kidding ourselves into thinking we're making more rational decisions when actually it's based on how we feel. And I thought about that from the advantage, from example, for, say, for example, the boss smokes and you smoke with the boss or you're on the golf team with the boss. Mm -hmm. Those things absolutely make oh. a difference. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't think Abs they do. Absolutely. No question about it. You know, that, and, and we know, for example, because in studies of empathy, uh, we can measure empathy because empathy is produced by the premotor cortex of the brain in the, in the form of these mirror neurons that give us the ability to read what's going on with each other. Uh, we know when they study empathy that people's empathy drops when they're dealing with somebody of a different race, and it raises when you're dealing with somebody of the same race. Now, again, this is not there are exceptions to this because if we've been exposed to a lot of people who are different from us, it, it diminishes the effect to some degree. But it also leads to understanding of why it is that people race to help out people who are like them but are more hesitant to help out people who are different from them. Um, it's this tendency is to it's I think the, the Latin term is homophily or drawn from the Latin term means roughly love of same we're drawn towards people who are like us we're more sensitive to them we have more empathy for them because we can relate to them better and this leads nicely to the next subject because you say most of our personal biases are not personal at all and one pattern that's particularly damaging to change and innovation and transformation efforts is groupthink Yes. Well, this gets back to the work that we talked about with our search for belonging. Our tendency to want to fit in with the group is, is a prime human need. Um, it is maybe our most important human need to fit in with the groups that we're a part of because, um, because that's where survival was oriented from years ago. You know, we couldn't survive by ourselves. We had to survive as part of our group or tribe or whatever. And so as a result of that, um, if we're in a group and a lot of people start to have a particular point of view, the threat response says, don't be too different. Um, and we may go along with something, um, even though we're not sure of it, because everybody else is going along with it. There are very famous examples of this. The at Morton Thayer call, the company that produced the space shuttle, the Challenger space shuttle that blew up. There were people who saw that there was a problem, but they didn't say anything because everybody else said it was fine. The same thing was true for the Bay of Pigs invasion. There were people who said, that, this ain't going to work. Everybody said, just, just be quiet. You know, we're fine. And, and so people went along with it. And I think most everybody who's listening to us has had a moment where they've done this themselves. They've gone along with a group, even though they had questions about something, because it felt safer to fit in. You give loads of exercises in the book of how we can start dealing with this. But I think you know, a, a group or an organization starts with the per, with the individuals within it. So that's the place to start. So if there's one exercise we can do to start our journey on identifying or maybe counteracting our biases, because as you say, time and time again, we cannot get rid of them because they're there for survival reasons. But how can we start that journey? I think the first thing, and this is true for individuals and organizations, and by far the most important, is to recognize that we have bias. You, me, and everybody else, we all have bias. It's fundamental to how the human mind works. And instead of being ashamed of it, instead of being embarrassed about it, instead of hiding it, we need to learn to embrace the reality that we have that and then learn to deal with it and manage it. And on an individual basis, that means 
doing some of the work that we need to do to be more aware of ourselves and also creating relationships with people outside of ourselves who are bold enough to give us feedback. And also some of the things you talked about, meditation and mindfulness, which which are some of the, you know, I've been a meditation teacher for 20 years and it's, it's had a huge impact on me in terms of doing this work. Because when we stop and we take that time to check in with ourselves, often we can notice those patterns that we just kind of roll right over on a normal basis. The same is true on an organizational level. If we understand that it's normal doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're awful. It doesn't mean you're racist, sexist, or whatever. But it's normal in organizations for certain people to, to be seen in a higher light than other people, for certain departments to be seen in a higher light. And if we recognize that that's going to be happening, then we can inquire into where that's happening. And when we find it, do something to fix it. But if we, want, if we need for our own ego to believe that we're above that, then we're going to step right over it and miss it all the time. So the irony is by embracing the fact that we have this bias on both the personal and organizational level, we've got a far greater chance of addressing it than by pretending it's not there. And this is a reminder that this show was brought to you with thanks to Microsoft for Startups. And Howard, for people who want to find out more about your work and your workshops and keynotes, etc., where can they find you? You can get me on howardjross.com, um, also udarta, U-D-A-R-T-A.com. Also, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Author of everyday bias, identifying and navigating unconscious judgments in our daily lives, and friend of the innovation show, Howard Ross, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Aiden, it's been such a pleasure again, and I look forward to doing it again.